this privilege to be here in Jackson, Tennessee on this Palm Sunday in this unity worship between these three glorious churches. City Fellowship Baptist Church, Pastor Russ. I think I'm safe for just doing the first name. <laughs> the First Baptist Church, Pastor Wayne Scott, who has been so hospitable since I entered the doors. Thank you very much, Pastor. To my friend and brother, the pastor of the historic First Baptist Church, Pastor Watson. Uh, who kind of threw me a hint uh, that I am not to preach an hour. <laughs> but he didn't say anything about if I passed up an hour <laughs> and preached two hours. <laughs> but I'm excited to be here today and to be a part of something glorious to give us an opportunity on earth to see what heaven will be like. There won't be segregation in heaven. We're all just going to be God's children. I had um, somewhat of a multicultural church uh, kind of very small percentage of persons who were not African Americans, and they came to our church for about two months, but after hearing me preach, they went back to their churches. <laughs> so I hope I do not uh, cause this unity service uh, to separate. But today I would like to read a passage in Matthew chapter number 21 verses 1 through 11. Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. And it reads, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her coat by her, untie them and bring them unto me. If any man says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a coat, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the coat and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. You may be seated. The grass withereth, the flower thereof faded away, but the word of God shall stand forever. A Palm Sunday sermon. A Palm Sunday sermon. Many people are accustomed to dignitaries and government officials in particular arriving in their cities and towns in grand ways. In most instances, heads of state make a dramatic statement upon their arrival at the airport, both domestic and international 
airports. Rarely does the aircraft of a head of state pull up to the jetway like all of our aircraft would do. For several reasons, this is not the practice. They are shielded from one-on-one -on -one contact with the general population. Security can be more efficiently managed and a grand entrance will add to the importance of their visit. Therefore, the public arrival is preferred. People pay attention to these public arrivals. They, they, these dignitaries, they deplane down a ramp, wave into the crowds, and they are given the red carpet treatment. They arrive into the cities in motorcades, sometimes with people lining the parade roof. I recall my former days as a Lake Charles Housing Authority Commissioner that I attended a national conference in Washington, D.C. Because it had been leaked that the President of the United States would address us later uh, that next day, I got up early, got a seat right up front, about 20 feet away from the podium, and I sat there after going through security, and I waited to see what was going to happen. And all of a sudden, President Ronald Reagan came from behind the curtain. And of course, in my view, when he waved, and I was only 20 feet away, I believe he was waving just at me. I was all excited. I got an opportunity at the end of his speech to be on the rope line and to shake my first U.S. president's hand. Excitement was in the air because President Reagan had arrived that day. Well, now I can only imagine the excitement in the air over 2,000 years ago when Jesus, greater than any head of state, arrives in the city of Jerusalem. Jesus gets the equivalent on Palm Sunday of the red carpet treatment. The text is about Jesus' arrival uh, near the Mount of Olives, but more importantly, his trip into the historic and holy city of Jerusalem. There is a strategic question that we hear asked at the end of this passage. And there is a necessary answer that all of us need to have for this question. We are exposed in this passage uh, to some principles. The principle of preparation for ministry. The principle of assignment in ministry. Obedience in ministry. We even encounter the Lordship of Christ in ministry. The, the effects of praise on people in ministry. And the necessity of the gospel message in ministry. And the list could go on and on. But this morning I want to briefly look at the preparation, the prophecy, and then finally the processional. No processional or parade, uh, and in this case, the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem is successful unless there is some, some crucial planning and preparation. We see there in verses 1 through 3, they go through a period of preparation as they make ready for Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Preparation involves planning. Benjamin Franklin once said, if you fail to plan, you are planning to fail. And certainly on this Palm Sunday, Jesus and his disciples who are under strict divine orders are not planning to fail, but they are making this plan for Jesus' grand entry into the city of Jerusalem. The activities that are in motion here are taking place in what is known Passion Week, a Holy Week. 
that week that takes place between Palm Sunday and Resurrection Sunday. Geographically, again, it takes place between the Mount of Olives and the Holy City of Jerusalem. The Mount of Olives is the place outside Jerusalem, and it is about just a little less than two and a half miles from Jerusalem. Can you imagine the people are getting ready? Jesus is sending his disciples so that they can go into the city and secure his prophetic mode of transportation. Jesus, in about nine months, has now visited about 30 cities. He is busy making himself known. But on this day, he will make his grand entrance into the city of Jerusalem. Jesus has some wonderful titles. And in verse number three of our text, he is identified as Lord. In verse five, he is labeled as king. In verse number 11, he is called both prophet and then he is called Jesus. And so now these two disciples, we'll call them his forerunners, they are dispatched from the Mount of Olives to go into the city of Jerusalem and secure Jesus' mode of transportation. Their mission is clear as they leave the mountain. They know what they are going to do. They are on this errand to locate the service donkeys which will be used to haul Jesus into Jerusalem. They are not told to go and find any war horses, but they are told to go and find these donkeys. The donkeys help to depict Jesus' humility and his claim to the throne. The donkeys are a symbol of peace and not a symbol of war. Of course, everybody in this crowd uh, is expecting Jesus to be more than a peacemaker. Uh, they actually want him to get the fight started. But Jesus is here to be a man of humility and a man of peace. And I believe this morning in any situation that we allow Jesus to get in, it takes the war mode out. And it inserts the emotions of peace. The two disciples are provided specific instructions about the donkey to be used for Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. They are not to find war horses, but also they are not to go and locate wild donkeys. But they will find some domesticated donkeys. And notice the language he says that when you get into the village, you will find them and they're going to be tied up. They're not going to be running wild. Jesus prepares his disciples in this preparation period for any rejection or resistance that they may encounter. And so my brothers and sisters, he says to them, if you are questioned, about why you are untying these animals, you are to provide them with this answer. The Lord has need of them. This time we find Jesus calling himself Lord and saying the Lord has need of them. Uh, they are getting ready to be put into service for the Lord. Therefore, in our mission, we must allow some prayer time in order to strengthen us for our journey. For no one works for the Lord any length of time and does not encounter some resistance. Jesus already knew because of the prophetic word that there would be some resistance to untying these domestic donkeys. And so he gets his disciples ready. On Sunday mornings, as we come to worship, especially in a unity worship on Palm Sunday, Jesus is preparing us for resistance. Some people may not like 
these three churches coming together on Palm Sunday. But we do it because we know it's right. And it's good for our fellowship and our existence here on this planet. And so in this Palm Sunday sermon, we see there is preparation in verses 1, 2, and 3. By the time we arrive at verses 4 and 5, we see the prophecy, first of all, from the Old Testament. There is a favorite practice of Matthew of inserting fulfillment citations throughout his writings. As a matter of fact, he is the only one of the gospel writers to mention two animals. Mark and Luke and John only mention one animal. But Matthew tracks the prophetic word that's recorded in Zechariah chapter 9, verse number 9, and he quotes the Old Testament reference that you're going to find these two donkeys, a mother and the mother's child. And so he uh, is, is giving this prophetic word for them to understand that they are in the will of the Lord. In Mark chapter 11, verse 2, we understand that this young donkey had never had anyone to ride on his back before. If you will, it's a car with no miles on it. And it's been waiting on Jesus. I remember my college days, I went through about four used cars, driving six hours one way for two and a half years trying to get a diploma. And notice I said diploma, I don't know how much education I got, but at least I learned where all the bumps in the road were. <laughs> but I wore out these, these four used cars going back and forth from Lake Charles to Dallas. One Sunday I drove up to church and uh, my parking place was near the door where people would enter. Uh, and I backed in instead of pulling forward because of the smoke that would come from the tailpipe. The members were out there. You know how members do. Uh, they were fanning the smoke if that was going to help it go away and going into the front of the church. But my old uh, former pastor's wife, the organizing pastor of our church, had been there 44 years. And she said uh, to me that morning, we've got to do something. You need a better car. And I immediately told her, I don't have money. I'm going to make this one work until things get better. And so she decided that she would talk to the officers, and they got up one Sunday, uh, and they got the church to agree, and I was hesitant about it, that they were going to buy me a car. And I was afraid it was a trick, and I was trying to block it. And she said to them that when you all get this new car, be sure you buy one with the fewest miles on it. He needs to know what a new car is like. I, I think about that because they took that vote on an Easter Sunday. It was about Palm Sunday when my car was smoking. And the Sunday after Easter, I had a brand new car. Yeah. I kind of know what it was. Jesus rides into town under this prophetic word in Zechariah 9 and 9. And he goes in on a donkey uh, caught in the Mark 11 and 2 that had never had anybody to ride on that donkey before. And so as we think about the prophecy, we see it comes from the Old Testament. But the prophecy is also, as we look at verses 4 and 5, it is about, it is about the old city. For we hear the words, daughter of Zion, here referring to the holy city of Jerusalem. The king uh, will be the Messiah. He will be unarmed, simply dressed, and riding on a donkey. This is a contrast to an armed soldier mounted on a war horse. The king comes gentle, in humility and peace. Jesus' life follows a divine plan. 
We too must discover our life's plan and discover our spiritual gifts so that they can be used in the service of the law. We understand that delays and amendments to our plans become the order of the day. Many times I have attempted things that did not work out, but I've discovered that every delay is in your favor when you are a child of God. I remember one time my wife and I, and I know a lot of us don't like to talk about it, years ago when we were first married, over 32 years ago, we, we went out and uh, we tried to get this new car, uh, but the loan was declined. Uh, but I also discovered later that I would not have been able, we would not have been able to pay the note. Every delay is in your favor. I told you about that car earlier. God provided a car that I was trying to get myself. And so they are in the midst of this prophecy about this old city. They go through a period of preparation. They look at the prophecy as laid out in Zechariah 9 and 9. And someone may be thinking this morning, how is this a Palm Sunday sermon? Well, we're getting to that now in verses 6 through 8. For the pathway of Jesus is prepared. The text says, and the disciples went and they did as Jesus commanded. These disciples are ready to trust Jesus without any questions. We do discover that they wanted him to fulfill their expectations. They were really desiring an earthly king, someone that would take over, destroy their enemies, and position them to be world leaders. How ignorant some of us, as ignorant Christians, have prayed that God would kill our enemies. But that's not the kind of God that we serve. They prepare this path for Jesus. They found the donkey as Jesus had instructed and they brought these donkeys to Jesus. They gave up some of their garments and they put them on the donkey's backs. And Jesus was placed on the back of the donkey. A multitude assembled themselves on what I call the parade route and paved the roadway with their garments and with palm tree branches. For the scripture says some of them cut down palm trees, John 12 and 13, and they laid them in the roadway. They were giving Jesus the red carpet treatments. Parades have long been a way to provide honor to soldiers in the aftermath of military victories are to honor those that reign in positions of authority. These are processions through the streets of a village, a town, a city. This parade, like others, has a parade marshal. His name is Jesus. And he's riding on the back of this donkey. Jesus is setting the stage for something larger than a parade. He's actually setting the stage for a Palm Sunday sermon. They proclaim the praise of Jesus. There was no need for a marching band because the multitude banded together their voices and they cried out, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. These actions are all in keeping with the prophecy in Zechariah 9 and 9. The city, the Bible says, was moved. Some translation says 
it was stirred. Actually, the word that would be stronger, it was shaken as by an earthquake because of the procession of Jesus into the city of Jerusalem. Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem is building up to his primary ministry. It is building up to the question of the day. All of the crowd's excitement prompted a three-word question that our churches ought to be prompting in society today. When they heard the praise of the people, when they saw the excitement of the people about Jesus coming into town, the crowd started questioning, who is this? That ought to be the question that people are asking the church today. Who is this? And it would give us a chance, all of us, collectively, to preach a sermon. This crowd might have been filled with those who had experienced the miracles of Jesus. Maybe someone who was a wine taster at the wedding in Cana of Galilee where Jesus transformed ordinary water into extraordinary wine. Maybe in the crowd there was that woman who had been healed from an issue of blood that she had suffered from for 12 long years. Possibly the blind man or some of his family members were present. The man had received his sight. Could it be it was a segment of the multitude that had been fed by Jesus with five loaves and two small fish? Just people in general that had been blessed by the preaching, the teaching, and the healing ministry of Jesus. I'm excited today that Jesus always has somebody in the crowd who's willing to speak up for him. And so they were crying out, Hosanna to the God in the highest, to the God of the heavens. And they asked the question, who is this? Who is this that's starting all of this commotion in our town? One part of the multitude was praising the God in the highest. But there's another segment of the multitude who's crying out, who is this? In other words, it does not matter how many people we win to Christ. There's still just one more left who's crying out, who is this? They were inquiring about the shouts and the commotion in the streets. The praise of one crowd spiked the interest of another crowd. What are we doing today that's causing the interest of the world to become interested in Jesus Christ? This must be a person of real fine stature for so many to be lining the streets, paving the path with their clothes and palm tree branches, and then lifting up their voices in a word of praise. An unusual Christ has stirred up an unusual praise. And now it leads to an important question. And this gives us the sermon for Palm Sunday. When we hear the question, who is this? This multitude could have very well been saying, what must I do to be saved? This probing question leads to a Palm Sunday sermon. When we hear the response from the other crowd, it's kind of like, one preacher was put out of business for the day. All of a sudden, the whole crowd takes over the preaching business. One crowd asks the question, who is this? Three words, who is this? And then there is a basic three-word response with some additional qualifiers. The other crowd 
in response to the question, who is this? Here comes the sermon. They declare in three words, this is Jesus. But there are some qualifiers as they say this is Jesus. We ought to be declaring Jesus at every opportunity that we get. Interestingly, the other part of the multitude had the answer. It is tragic today that there are people who come to church who cannot act, answer the question, who is this? But they said, this is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. But they also demonstrated that they knew him in a special way. They responded to the question, who is this? By announcing his name, Jesus. And we ought to call his name. They said, this is Jesus. And then they also informed the other crowd that we know a little bit more about him. They also announced one of his titles, that this is Jesus, the prophet. But they also declared that not only do we know his name, and no one of his titles, but we know about his dwelling place. This is Jesus of Nazareth of Galilee. My brothers and sisters, this is a Palm Sunday sermon that ought to be preached every day during the year. The church ought to be responding to the world as they ask the question, who is this? We ought to be saying, this is Jesus, when we think about what God has done for us in reconciling the world back to himself through Jesus Christ, we ought to stop taking credit and start pointing people to Jesus. When they say that we've taught a good lesson, our response ought to be, this is Jesus. When they say that we have been singing some good Christian songs, our response ought to be, this is Jesus. When they talk about our good works in mission, we ought to say, this is Jesus. Because those of us who are Christians, we understand we can only do all things through Jesus that strengthens us. We ought to talk about him. Every time we get a chance, we ought to tell the story about Jesus. And in our faith tradition, we talk about it every Sunday. How he went to the cross called Calvary. How he died on the cross. And they placed his body in Joseph's new tomb. But we don't leave him in the tomb. In the message, we tell them early Sunday morning early Sunday morning that Jesus got up from the dead with all power of heaven and earth in his hand. And we want people to know that he lives. He lives. This is a Palm Sunday sermon. Who is this? This is Jesus. That's his name. The prophet, that's one of his titles. Of Nazareth and Galilee, that's where he's from. If you join hands with someone now, as we go to God in Jesus' name in prayer. Amen. God, we come to you this morning in the matchless name of Jesus. Because we know there is power in his name. And as we have proclaimed this gospel, this Palm Sunday sermon that came not from one preacher but was preached by a whole multitude that knew who Jesus really is. We pray that if there's a person in here today, as the pastor would come and extend to them an opportunity to give their life to Christ, that they would not delay, but the Palm Sunday sermon will have reached their hearts today, and they will become a disciple of Jesus Christ. It is in Jesus' name we pray. And we praise his name. Amen.